And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Hi folks, I'm Tom Vassell, and today we're taking a look at Dungeon of the Mad Mage board game set in the Waterdeep Dungeons and Dragons universe. Now, if I'm counting correctly, this is the sixth maybe the seventh a game in this universe. From Castle Ravenloft to Dungeons of Ashardlan to Legends of Driss, there's a lot of games in this universe. Now the last few have had Kevin Wilson specifically taking these and going farther with them and making them into a campaign setting. But if you've played one of those games before, this is very similar. It's the same kind of game and there's even some compatibility between the different systems if you want to. If you've never played this game before, well, hold on, let me tell you a little bit about it. First of all, even though this is called Dungeon of the Mad Mage, and even though this looks like a dungeon crawl, it's really kind of a cooperative game. You and some other people will take on some adventurers, and you're going to go accomplish missions in a dungeon. Um, well, you say, well, that sounds like a dungeon crawl. Well, it is, sort of. Let me show you a little bit about how the game works, and then we'll come back. This is, I like all the other ones, so there's no way I'm not going to like this one unless it deviates that far. It does not. But I'll tell you a little bit more when we come back. At the beginning of the game, each player is going to pick one of their heroes that they want to be. So you can see we have Marcone, the human sorcerer, and I'm not going to try to say all these names, these fantasy names, but you're going to take this person, you're going to get them on their first level. They have some stats on them, your armor class, hit points, speed, surge value, a special ability, and some starting powers that you're going to pick from the different power cards that you have. So you're going to pick your powers at the beginning of the game. You have utility powers, daily powers, at will powers, expert powers. Expert powers are pretty much only used if you're playing a campaign game and when you level up type things. But you're going to pick some of these. So this tells me here that I have Hellish Rebuke. So I need to find Hellish Rebuke that's in here somewhere. Here it is. That's a daily power. He automatically gets, or she automatically gets, Hellish Rebuke. So now we're going to pick says one at will power, so we can pick sword and shield, precision attack, or hurled dagger. We'll take sword and shield. Two utility powers, so I get two of these. Take lucky charm and renowned adventurer. And then one fighter daily power. So maybe we'll take uh, this one here, smash and slash. So these cards are going to go in front of you. Now many of the cards, mostly the daily powers and sub most of the utility powers, you can use once per mission. You do it and then you flip it over when you're done with it. Although sometimes it's a, like this one here, it just says each time you roll one, re-roll that die. These powers are going to be used to attack other monsters. So for example, sword and shield here, that's the at will power. That's where you're going to use most of the time because you can use this one over and over and over again. In this case, it says attack an adjacent monster and hit or miss encounters deal one less damage to you at the start of your next turn. So as you come across different monsters, you will fight them utilizing the, your stats and your at will power. So let's say, for example, Akka is going to attack this thug. So Akka is going to use the sword and shield. Roll a die. She rolls a 15. 15 plus 8 is 23. We now compare it to the armor class of the thug, which is 12. 23 is much greater than 12. So then we see how much damage. One damage, boom, the thug is out of the picture. Easy enough. If the thug was attacking Akka, the thug would roll a die. 15 plus 6 is 21. Akka's AC is 11. 21 is higher than C. This would do plus 1 and give her disadvantage which this is token here, which means next time she would roll two dice and take the lower result when she attacks. And so you can see a 15 was a pretty good roll. If it had been a 5, 5 plus 6 is 11. 11 would have been lower than AC, so would have done nothing. Now special abilities and things can change how that works, but that's basically how you attack somebody. 
players are going to be choosing a mission from this adventure book. You can start with, you know, the first one and go through them. You can pick one and do it as standalone, but they're mostly made to play through very specific ones. What they'll do is they're going to have you make a pile of dungeon tiles and there will have certain dungeon tiles usually placed somewhere in there so that when you find that tile it will trigger the next thing in the mission. Your characters will start on a starting spot in this case it's going to be this entry well and on a character's turn you are going to take an action plus you have a move. Now characters have a certain amount of distance that they can move it's equal to their speed on the card and they're going to be moving from square to square. Now, once you move, it's possible at the end of your turn, if you are next to an empty spot on your board, we'll draw the top dungeon tile. We'll look for the arrow on this tile and we'll make it face you. So this will slowly build the dungeon out. If there is a monster on that tile, then you'll go through the monster deck. You'll draw the top monster. It's a zombie beholder. That, zomb that monster will show up on the monster spot. Now this is a big one and probably this zombie beholder wouldn't show up in that particular spot. Maybe instead it would be a grung. I mean it depends on the mission. You will be building these monster decks at the beginning. A little frog, not too bad. You will then take that card for that monster and put it by you. At the end of your turn, you activate all the monster cards that you have. Each monster card will tell you exactly what it's going to do. So if it's on the same tile as your hero, it will attack the closest hero with a dagger, which is down here. If it's within one tile, it leaps to attack the closest hero with a dagger, then goes back to its starting space. Otherwise, it moves one tile towards the closest hero. So each monster has very specific things it will do. Here, it leaps, attacks, and then jumps back. By the way, really annoying these stupid frogs because usually enemies will run up, they'll hit you, but then you can hit them back. To get to that frog, I'll need to run over there and swing at him. So you have one action that you can do in your turn and often it will be uh, an attack that you're going to be taking uh, against your opponent, but it could also be moving again. You have a free move, but you can do other moves. Other things can happen too. You will sometimes, uh, okay, now it's another monster shows up. Here's a monster. But there will also be some trap tokens that might be placed you know, on the tile. And you can try to disable a trap or you turn over the trap and hopefully draw a safe. There's not very many of those. Or it might do some damage. Here's an arrow trap that does two damage. Or even worse, it says draw. And then I have to go to the trap deck draw the top one and see what kind of weird, nasty trap is going to be hitting me. Meanwhile, you're going to be running around trying to kill these enemies because if you don't, they're going to be going after the turn of the person who drew them and attacking you. You also want to kill enemies because when you kill enemies, you get a chance to draw treasure. Sometimes treasure is just money, which will be mostly spent between turns, but sometimes it's an item that you get and you'll be able to have that item and use that item, healing or a ring of mind shielding. So you'll be drawing these from random decks. Also, when you kill monsters, you will get to keep that monster and that monster is going to be worth a certain amount uh, as you kill a monster. It's going to be worth a certain amount of experience. You can see this one's three experience. The veteran here is one experience and so on. Now when you draw a tile that has a black arrow, you're going to draw an encounter card. Encounter cards are almost always bad. There's some that are fine, but maybe it will trigger off a trap. Here's a nothing happens. That's nice. Put a new monster out. Attacks every hero. And in fact, if your hero does not discover a new tile, on their turn. So if I don't go here and discover a new tile that will in this case add two traps and two monsters, which is not fantastic. If I don't discover that, then you have to draw from this encounter pile. So that can be a pretty big deal. And as time goes by, the dungeon can get bigger and nastier and full of beasts. Sometimes you'll come across some giant beast that you have to fight. They're your villain. These are the big bad guys that you're going to be attacking. Here's the Mad Mage himself. You'll be fighting these people and they have their own card and could be attacking after everyone's turn. So there's some big ones. But the monsters themselves are, are kind of a means to an end because you are simply trying to do whatever the adventure tells you to do. Uh, for example, one adventure, you have to defeat a certain kind of monster. You have to defeat that monster. Or maybe you just need to find a tile and get all your people to it.
the monsters are going to keep attacking you, so clearing them out is a good idea. Uh, there are a couple other things in the game. Sometimes you'll get an Elder Ruin. When you do this, you're going to roll a die, look at it, and a 1 through 10, it's good. 11 through uh, 20, or well, 1 through 10, it's bad. 11 through 20, it's good. So here, War, every time you take damage, take an extra damage. I don't want that. But if you might deal damage with a daily power, do an extra damage. That's awesome. So these are Banes and Boon cards that you can get. There's also a spell deck. Some of the creatures will cast spells on you. So it will say, draw until you get a certain spell. So I might draw, oh, Ray of Frost. Then the monster will do that to me. But sometimes the heroes have a chance to cast these. And there's some very common spells that you'll see, like the Magic Missile. Things from the D&D universe that you'll have. There's a lot of other things that may happen as the game goes by, but it's mostly uh, kind of contained to what I just told you in that framework. There's a lot of miniatures in the game. You can get a deluxe version painted or unpainted. I like the painted versions of these games, obviously. Now, I don't know that I would claim that these are great paint jobs, but I can tell you how much better they are than mine, which is very good. I especially like some of the models, like this little frog I like. There's this really awesome scorpion that's in the game with, like, lightning coming out of it. What is this? A Skaladar, right? And the game looks really neat as you are moving along and putting all these tiles together. And this is just some of the tiles in the game. There's quite a few of them. There's a lot of components that come with the game, too. We have coins, where you'll keep track of money, hit points, trap tiles, you know, conditions. Here we have advantage and disadvantage, or weakened, you'll put this on characters. So all these tokens, you'll have to keep separate. Everything fits in a nice plastic insert that all fits inside the box. You know, it all fits in there, but there's definitely a lot of it. I wish the game came with more than a single 20-sided die. But other than that, I'm pretty happy with the components. There's a separate rule booklet, which explains all the rules of the game. And then there's the adventure booklet. You can play through scenarios, like I said, as a campaign. Possibly, you know, eventually leveling your character up where things are going to get better. As the games progress, your characters can die. When you die, you will have to spend a healing surge. A healing surge will bring you back to life at half your hit points. However, if you run out of healing surges and someone dies, then you lose the game. That's how you lose. You win by accomplishing the mission. But as you upgrade to the second level and you get those expert powers and you can spend tokens to buy various things, and there is a 13 mission game if you want to play through. You also gives you some recommended things to take if you're playing through the first game. You can, it tells you what powers you should take. And the decks for the monsters and the treasures will also change. It will tell you as you play each one here, take the flying swords out, add the flaming flying swords. Take this encounter out, add this encounter. So there's things like that that will make the deck harder and harder as you go through the different missions. And there you have it. That's Dungeon of the Mad Mage. This may be my favorite of the sets so far. And there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, I love those Elder Runes. Of course, they're really nasty and negative, but it's neat when you find, when you get yours. It's like getting a special ability. I like the expert cards. But I especially like the different monsters in this one. I like the sword that you come across, a flying sword. You fight it. I, those frogs are really annoying, but eh. then there's these little mind creatures who come and they suck your mind out the first time. It's not a big deal. The second time, they'll can do five damage. It's this little monster. You're like, ah, I don't feel like taking my time dealing with that. You better. Now, I said at the beginning, this is a cooperative game, not a dungeon crawl. And it does feel like a dungeon crawl to some degree, but you have to play it like a cooperative game. You have to think carefully, work together, and take out monsters, and you look at it and say, okay, it's, a, it's a, there's, there's certainly luck, right? Rolling the dice, you might lose because you roll poorly, you might win because you roll great, but you have to sit there and say, okay, well, this monster is the most dangerous, we need to take this out. When do I use my daily power? Because your daily power, you saw that the, the one power that I was showing gave you a plus one, but I might have a daily power that says, this gives you plus six and does three damage. Well, that's a really, it's probably gonna kill some of these monsters, which take two or three damage to take them out. When do I use that power? I can only use it once permission, but I need to figure it out. Do I save it for the big bad guy? Or do I use it on this, maybe I have one that hits all the creatures next to me for one, now's the time to use it, let's clear them out so we can complete this mission. There definitely is a, tile in the game which I almost found positively game-breaking 
where when you stand on this tile, I forget the name of it, but when you stand on the tile, you are safe. You don't draw in counter cards as long as you end your turn in this counter tile. So if you get this tile in a nice central location, you can attack a monster and then run to this tile and you know basically sit there and be like all right or just stand on that tile let the monsters come to you slowly killing them all fighting them off but without having to worry about drawing and counter cards that's huge however it's made up for it by there being lots of nasty negative things so i don't feel that bad about it the five characters are good i mean they're your typical fighter paladins but they have different powers and things than we've seen before in the game if you can't tell, I do enjoy this a lot. I like the variety of creatures that come. I like the different adventures. I don't normally play through these as a campaign style game. I like that I can one-shot them. I just manipulate the decks around, change them up a little bit, adding stuff in or out depending on what the scenario says, and playing through it. I It gives me a nice sense of adventure. It's fun. We all work together. Uh, sometimes you'll feel like it, you're not going to win, overwhelmed, and yet you somehow pull out a victory. Other times you think it's in the bag and then you lose at the very end. Either way, I think it's fairly balanced. It's not overly hard, but at the same time, it presents a good challenge. It's interesting to play, and this system, while it's about a decade old at this, this point, is still one I really like to play. So that's Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Dice, Tower, and Judgment approved!